Welcome everyone to the second session today on good health and well-being. Um, okay, thank you, Area and the Asia Network for inviting me to this session. Um, my name is Stefan Nechuk, and I'm a senior health systems advisor for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, focused on work in Asia, and I'm based in Delhi, India. The key themes in this session: mental health access care and the nexus between environmental health and climate change are central to a future looking dialogue on looking over the horizon and imagining the potential trajectories of national health systems and what role innovations might play. We have a strong panel of speakers, so I will make a few friendly remarks only. All of the issues highlighted in this session will place tremendous future depends on national health systems, and we know there is a tendency for health spending to rise faster than GDP per capita across the world. Thus, the core question is how and what kinds of innovations are best situated to address these challenges. While innovation in general has resulted in longer, healthier, and happier lives in Asia and around the world, innovation in and of itself is not always a silver bullet. To be useful from a social, not only an economic perspective, innovations need to be affordable, they need to have proven utility, they need to be integrated into national health systems and be able to be delivered to most citizens and not crowd out existing uh, effective treatments or interventions. So affordability. Um, health is an unusual domain as it is both considered a human right in many countries and yet is also one of the most rapacious and often poorly regulated markets in the world. Within existing health systems, if you want innovations to be widely adopted, they need to be affordable within existing or future budget envelopes. And the most important spending in that respect is public or pooled spending, which is the means to offer affordable services to the majority of people in a country. Um, government health spending in Asia varies widely, but to give some perspective, this ranges from about $7 per capita annually in Bangladesh at the low end to about $15 in Pakistan or about $22 in India to about $190 per capita in Thailand or 200 in Malaysia. The larger point is that public spending in middle income Asia is still a fraction of the approximately $5,000 per capita spent often wastefully in the United States. Thus innovation needs to be affordable. Um, second, innovations also need to be cost effective. Some innovations are very simple and have saved millions of lives. Um, oral rehydration therapy is an off-site example. Well, some innovations are brutally expensive and actually affect relatively few lives. Some specialized cancer drugs are an example of that. We already have tools at hand to measure the cost effectiveness of innovations through health technology assessments. And innovators need to work hand in hand with government regulators to ensure that the most effective innovations are getting to market and being supported by public budgets. High tap in Thailand is a good example of a middle income country priority setting agency that has enabled universal health coverage at relatively low levels of spending through a relentless focus on cost effectiveness. Uh, next, integration. Innovations in terms of tools or technologies that can only be delivered or used in cities or by the rich are of limited social utility. Thus, we need to innovate that can be used um, and leveraged not only by doctors, but by nurses, community health workers, and citizens as well. Given the costs associated with building and staffing hard infrastructure, there is high potential, for example, for some types of digital approaches, whether that be telemedicine, remote scanning, or et cetera, to play a role in both expanding coverage and containing costs. And of course, there are other examples as well. Finally, crowding out. We know that with fixed budgets, there's a tendency to see new or innovative as better than old, but there are opportunity costs. If a country is spending relative and integrates, for example, expensive new mental health treatments into its benefit package, there is a question then of what trade-offs will ensue? What existing services will not be covered? Um, I'm finished. Thank you again, and I hope that these four larger points help frame what will be a stimulating and thought-provoking session. I would like to welcome our guest speakers for the day. Uh, starting with the introductions first, so we have Sanju uh, Amontep on the panel today. So he's the founder of Sati App and a member of 
Global Shapers Community. He's an advocate for mental health who has personal experience with major depressive disorders, schizophrenia, and suicide. Saju has uh, advocated for the destigmatization of mental health and provided the public with an understanding of empathetic listening. Welcome, Saju, for the panel discussion today. Um, second on the speaker uh, panel, we have uh, Aryani. So Aryani is a young leader, social entrepreneur, public speaker, innovator, and a change maker. She has co-founded the not-for-profit Let's Talk, which aims to spread mental health awareness amongst adolescents and encourage them to speak up. Very important, right? The initiative has conducted 180-plus awareness sessions, impacted 20,000-plus people, and gained 200 volunteers globally. Again, uh, very excited to hear Ariani share her thoughts on the panel discussion today. Next, we have uh, Melin Wong. She uh, is the CEO and co-founder of Isabel. She leads the team at Isabel to empower organizations to build culture of workplace of well-being so that they can champion their employees over overall well-being more effectively and not just mental well-being, but also more importantly, social, physical and financial well-being because she thinks and understands that this is not just one part of the puzzle that needs to be solved, but rather a comprehensive solution that needs to be built. So she describes herself as being passionate about using tech to enable and create a positive impact in people's life. It would be interesting to hear from Melin about how she goes about uh, in terms of making organizations be more progressive in nature. So welcome, Melin, uh, for the session today. And um, finally, we also have uh, Shweta. So she is a crusader for positive change and is a personal coach and mentor to CEOs and senior corporate professionals. She has spoken multiple times at TEDx, IITs, IAMs, and Google offices in Asia. She focuses on happiness as a learnable skill and builds on clinical understanding of happiness through studies in uh, positive psychology, neuroscience, and various mind, body, spirit healing techniques. Welcome, Shweta, to the panel today. And it would be interesting to hear from you. How do you go about in terms of defining happiness and how uh, we can learn this skill of being happy. So uh, on that note, uh, we'll start with the first segment today, which is about mental health and setting the context. So we uh, start with you, Shweta, right? Uh, at the School of Happiness, you share the real meaning of happiness. And as you beautifully describe happiness as not just a pursuit, but rather a choice and not the absence of pain, but the appreciation of life. So what are some of the things that really stop us from making this choice to be happy? Mm, okay, so um, there is a book by uh, an author called Alan de Botton, and in that book, uh, it's called Status Anxiety. And in that book, he writes that if you are a five foot person in a five foot village, you're perfectly happy. But suddenly you become a five foot person and a six foot village and you're miserable. So the number one problem that we have today is comparison. The moment we go into a comparative mode, we, we start becoming unhappy. And in this day of social media, when everything is about filtering and, and comparisons, you cannot help but become unhappy. So that's the, that's the biggest problem that we have today because everything is out there and we always feel short in comparison to somebody else. And we only see what the other person wants us to see. But we don't know what's really going on in their life because we put these filters and we put these images that everybody thinks that, oh, this person is having a better life than me. And we all fail in comparison. So the moment we start having faith in our own selves and realizing that there is more to life than just being just comparing. So that I would say is the biggest problem that we have because comparing ourselves to other people. So, yeah, that's nice. what I would think. Very, very uh, beautifully put. I mean, the root cause of, you know, uh, something that stops us from making um, everyone happy is the comparison. And very interesting. Uh, and so I we do add something more. I mean, I, I mean, I know it's the comparison, but the problem with all of us is that our brain has a negativity bias. You know, we call that uh, ants, which is automatic negative thoughts. So the moment uh, we go into thinking, we start going into negative thinking. And they start thinking, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough, not pretty enough, not intelligent enough. And that is the biggest cause of our own self-sabotage. Interesting. And that calls for bringing more awareness, right, about uh, such negative thoughts, constantly comparison. 
and with growth of aware, uh, growth of social media i think uh, this has become a very prominent challenge and on that uh, on that thought i would uh, want to uh, question aryani that at let's talk you have conducted several awareness sessions right and that too for the adolescents so across these 35 chapters in india sri lanka and nepal you encourage people to seek help now could you please describe for us that um, how how do you um, describe the impact of awareness or lack of it in the entire spectrum of mental health sector yeah i think the lack of awareness about not just what mental illnesses are but what mental health is and how to take care of it is a really big problem that contributes to mental illness and and people not seeking support so for example if someone is struggling with depression but they don't know what depression is they've never heard of it they don't know what the symptoms are they don't know how to recognize it their family does not know how to recognize the symptoms how are they supposed to get help um and this is something that we see time and time again like we go to sessions um especially in economically underprivileged areas in government schools in india and we ask them have you ever heard of the term mental health and they have no idea what it is and then we ask them do you know what physical health is and they're like yes and then we ask them do you have physical education classes and they do but they don't have mental health classes they've never learned about these terms um so it's a real problem where like even though the stigma exists there's like a very very basic lack of understanding about mental health about mental illness and i think this really stops people from seeking the support that they need because just because you don't know about a mental illness it doesn't mean that you don't have it um so that's kind of the first component which is recognizing symptoms and also having awareness about what to do um so people need to know what their options are and how they can seek support secondly what we do and what's very important is that when i talk about mental health awareness and a mental health curriculum a lot of people assume that i mean like we should go to schools and talk about mental illness but a mental health curriculum should be a comprehensive understanding of how to take care of your mental health how to maintain healthy relationships how to have a good relationship with yourself um so we go to schools and we talk to children about things like you know if you're feeling sad then how should you take care of yourself who should you reach out to why is it important to reach out to people and i think that's a part of mental health awareness not only teaching people about okay this is a disorder and this is what you should do if you have it like teaching people about how to live healthy and happy lives because you know in school we learn math and science and all of these really important things but we never learn how to tackle life and and how to tackle relationships such fundamental things um so i think awareness about these things is very very important for us to have a happier society excellent excellent uh, you know ta- works that you have been conducting across these three countries um and like you said right i mean mental health is something which is not really taught uh we are not aware about uh, how we 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 understand the physical health but a, as important as physical health is uh, likewise i would want to put across that mental health is equally important for uh, an individual to understand um so we will um go to melin um so melin you since you work with um, you know corporations organizations and um on with the work that you have been doing the approach that you have taken to um uh, identify what could uh, organizations adopt so how would you describe the role that mental health plays even in our professional lives why is it a selling point and how intertwined is the impact of mental wellbeing in both our personal as well as professional lives thanks sonia um i believe many of us including myself you know would agree that the state of our mental wellbeing plays a significant role Uh, in both our professional and and personal lives and they're very much intertwined you know it is not humanly possible to uh put a demarcation on uh, you know our mental well-being uh, both for work and outside of work and it is is particularly clear as the last two and a half years during the pandemic when you know the home is also your office is also your work of play is also your family place uh and so everything is kind of intertwined You know, uh, recently I was talking to a CHRO uh, of an SME tech firm in India, and what they shared with me was probably something that we can all relate to. They said, uh, you know, we really struggle with the work-life balance, um, uh, and you know, I try to tell my people that they will not have to answer calls after six o'clock, but that's just not the reality that we live in. You know, especially when when you're working across different uh, regions and time zones. uh and 
you know, I think that uh, a lot of companies uh, uh, resonate with that statement because, you know, their people will be working till late at night. And, you know, they try to like make that out by, uh, by supporting with social events, trying to get the teams together. And I think it is about, uh, uh, you know, addressing the, the big question of uh, is telling people st to stop working at a certain time, is that necessarily going to give back time to uh, quality time to the, the workers? And I think the answer is pretty much no, right? Um, organizations can, can maybe look at more uh, flexible uh, work policies that's really going to be applied to all employees, not just like senior managers who have to take calls in, the, in different time zones, uh, but, you know, to allow them that flexibility where they can, when they stay late to or work longer hours, that they can actually start work maybe later or, or uh, take time off during the week so that they can actually spend that time, you know, uh, uh, having quality time with their families. And that's going to be really helping with, you know, uh, both your professional mental well-being as well as uh, your outside of work well-being. Um, and I think there's also a, a big role for organizations to really equip uh, uh, their employees, their people, especially the uh, people leaders with the knowledge and really as well as the skills to really protect uh, uh, their teams from burnout and the mental stresses that tends to go with, with all our jobs, you know? Like how to recognize what burnout uh, and stress looks like. You know, what are some of the trigger words we hear from our own people when they talk about, you know, their jobs? Um, and, and having really kind of an empathetic conversation with them, not as manager and team member, but rather uh, person to person, like as if you were a friend. But you need to know how to uh, how to ask even that question without being intrusive. You know, so there's a lot of skills involved uh, in that, uh, and I think that's where work and, and and personal kind of mental well-being kind of comes in. Very uh, very nicely put. And uh, on the point of empathetic conversations, it's a great segue to the next question for Saju. Uh, so you have been doing, you know, amazing work uh, at building Setu app and uh, you have been a big advocate of empathetic listening and empathetic conversations. So for the panel uh, today, can you please share how would you describe empathetic listening and also weighing the importance of empathetic listening at our homes like uh, Melin just uh, talked about and also at the same time in the workplace, be it with your managers, your leaders, etc. And even your peer groups, right? So in the entire spectrum of solutions related to mental health, what role does empathetic listening and empathetic conversations play? Sure. Um, first of all, I apologize if there's maybe any um, drilling sound and hammering sound because the office next door is doing some renovation work. Um, but in, in terms of empathetic communications and empathetic listening, right, I think a lot of us can advocate that we really need more soft skills and essential, these sort of essential skills on a day-to-day -day basis and in you know and and make it um dissolve into our day-to-day -day, um, behaviors as well and you know a lot of time we believe that we are a good listener we are a good listener because we're already listening to someone but there's a there's there's a difference between listening with our brain where we analyze whatever the other person is constantly saying and we keep analyzing what they're saying and trying to find a solution for them and empathetic listening where you're not constantly analyzing what the other person is saying but rather truly listening to them and then not actually providing them advice, but reflecting the feelings and their emotions and, and their thoughts back to them. So for example, Sonia, if, if you know, if let's say we are, we are friends, uh, we are uh, peers, and then you're tired from your work and you come back home and you're like, today I'm so tired. You know, it's been such a long day. It's been raining as well. And my, my boss is just giving me so much work and uh, I don't know what to say anymore. And me as your friend, if I say that, oh, it's okay, everyone has work, you know, everyone is working late these days, it's okay, it'll get better, you know, just don't worry too much about it. So that's where I hear you, but I'm not really listening to what you're saying. But empathetic listening would be more of saying that, oh, I'm so sorry, it has, it must be such a tiring day for you with all the worrying and all the stuff that you have to do. And I know that your boss is also giving you a lot of work right now. I don't know if I can help you with anything, but maybe you can let me know if I can support you with anything. 
and I'm more than happy to help you out. So I'm not giving an advice that or telling you that everyone is feeling the same way. But what I'm trying to tell you is that I don't really know what you're doing, but I'm reflecting all your emotions and I'm here to support you. And that is basically the basic of, you know, what a psychologist would do to, to their client as well, you know, to build rapport, to use empathetic listening, to build a trust with one another um, so that the other person feels more comfortable opening up and sharing more of their, their thoughts and their feelings and their emotional um, difficulties to them as well. And so this is what would go to managers as well. If managers have empathic listening skills, empathic communication skills, rather than just saying that everything is the fault of the employee, they would try to have that person-to-person conversation with the employee, with the peers, to try to find out what is truly the, the triggering parts of the work that is causing that person to not, you know, be able to uh, submit the work in time or do anything in time. Or going back to what um, Shweta said, you know, when we have a lot of um, all these automatic negative thoughts, it's also because we're not being empathetic to ourselves. We're constantly comparing ourselves to other people and we have forgotten how to listen to ourselves as well. And so empathy is not just about how we provide it to other people, but it's also how we do it to ourselves and how we listen to ourselves. And it, it, you know, it transcends every sort of relationship that we have from, our, from us to ourselves, to our families, to our workplace, to even our strangers on the street. You know, how do we empathize with them rather than just telling them that it's their fault that this is happening? but rather listening to their problem and try to understand it from their point of view. And, and this is why it's so important that when we, we harness these um, essential skills. That's, that's very uh, interesting. I mean, uh, empathetic conversations, communications and listening, the role that it plays for a self and also with the peer group, your family members, your uh, friends, and not just that beyond that, even your professional colleagues, uh, your um, you know, uh, managers, your employees, your juniors. It's, I think, a very important um, quality that one must learn to have so that their relationships with their self, themselves and also with others improve. Um, and also, I mean, um, we, we go back to Melin. Um, so corporate leaders and HR professions, professionals in general, right? They, they tend to use some sort of employee engagement solutions but then why is there a need to build more comprehensive wellness solutions as an enabler of access to health? You know, this is a, this is a very interesting question. And, um, you know, when I think about just how many companies in Asia actually have uh, um, workplace well-being solutions, we're really looking at about 6% of the whole of Asia. And this is according to the Global Wellness Institute. That 6% of the entire region of Asia, and it's the lowest globally, right? Um, and it, this, it, this really aligns with uh, what I've observed uh, through talking to a lot of organizations in Asia, uh, even large ones, that uh, what they have... Um, tends to be very focused primarily on just mental well-being. And I think that became more of a buzzword as well, uh, especially in the last couple of years, you know, through the pandemic. Um, So when they do have solutions, especially tech solutions, they tend to be also very fragmented, you know, uh, a standalone kind of solution that kind of evolves, nothing around, uh, evolves around it. And majority of organizations actually have very programmatic approach, uh, very uh, ad hoc in nature. So just as an example, and this is just based off another recent conversation that I had with a a leader in a a tech firm based in Singapore. They said to me, you know, if I take an hour to attend a, a meditation session today or a mindfulness session, it means that I have to take, uh, you know, I have to work an hour later tonight just to make up for the the time lost. And, you know, that's because my workload hasn't changed. What really, uh, you know, uh, has done is I now need to make up. And, you know, he he says to me that, you know, if if they really want to impact my well-being, then the workload uh, needs to be audited and to really see if my job... Uh, uh, are do- is doable within an eight-hour workday, right? 
And I think this is where I see a lot of organizations kind of struggle when they, uh, when they take a very programmatic approach, which is majority of organizations, right? Let's provide uh, you know, our people with an app. Uh, let's provide them with a program on stress reduction or a meditation session. And a lot of these are kind of ad hoc. You know, it happens when somebody is able to organize it and it doesn't happen when you know, the HR team is very busy with their day-to-day job. Um, so while all these things are kind of great, I think team members are, starting, are not necessarily seeing this as, uh, as uh, helpful or even useful for their well-being. Uh, and sometimes these efforts just come across as very, you know, un- inauthentic and, and very unhelpful uh, because they really do nothing to address the root problem, right, within the organization, which ultimately is what culture, the actual culture of well-being within the organization or the lack thereof. So I think, you know, when I kind of look at uh, what I've been hearing from the, the large majority of organizations is that they have programs, they have initiatives, but ultimately majority of them, uh, uh, team members are still suffering from varying degrees of stress, burnout and anxiety, right? And so ultimately I think that, you know, for, uh, for a well-being solution or a system uh, to, to really work. It needs to begin with culture, right? The norms, the values, the, the shared belief system within an organization. Because without culture being the true north for well-being efforts, organizations are just going to run the risk of uh, very disconnected tactics. Here's a bit of here, a bit of there, you know? Uh, and that's what we are really seeing. And that has proved to be ineffective and unsustainable and also to a greater extent unscalable you know so this culture that needs to be addressed uh, uh, needs to address both the organization's aspects as well as the aspects of support uh, at the individual's level right to build this I think we need two things Um, firstly kind of equipping employees with knowledge and practices that will really help them understand and own their well-being, not, not just their mental well-being, but also their social, physical, and financial well-being. And then secondly, really look at organizational kind of policies, infrastructure, uh, the work and leadership culture uh, through a well-being lens, because I think that is going to be a, a, a real game changer for a lot of organizations, rather than just putting up piecemeal of uh, uh, solutions here and there. Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, like you said, well-being is not just one part of uh, the health, but rather a holistic approach that one can make. I mean, an organization can make to build their cultures, which are more uh, inclusive and supportive in nature. Um, Great. And uh, happiness, you know, we we spoke about happiness and how uh, it's something that needs to be understood in its entirety so that... uh, the wellness and well-being of an individual can actually uh, be taken care of. So we go back to Shweta and uh, Shweta, you have described happiness as a learnable skill. Now in that context, so what are some of the ways with respect to the change in habits, action or mindset through which we can lead more content and happier lives, not just, you know, maybe personal life, but also professional lives? Okay, Sonia, something I'm going to say, which doesn't go very well to a lot of people is, we have to take responsibility for our own happiness. You know, we talk about culture, we talk about organizations, we talk about government, talk about husbands, we talk about children. It's not their responsibility to make us happy. So yes, mental well-being, everything is important. But till I take ownership of my own well-being and my own happiness, nothing will happen. So I say, I want to lose weight, but excuse me, Sonia, can you exercise for me? I'm going to provide you with all the equipment there is in the world, but please exercise for me and make me slim. It's not going to work. The organization is going to give us everything, you know, uh, have the meditation classes, have this. But till I decide that I want to change myself and my well-being, nothing's going to happen. So, yes, I have to take ownership. And that's the very, very important part. So if I don't put in the effort and the time, nothing's going to happen, right? So I have all the stuff, but I don't have the uh, initiative. So what you have to do is, first of all, 
decide that I am responsible for my well-being, my mental well-being and my physical well-being. And hopefully you have your uh, organization or your circumstances which can support that. And we know that, um, you know, the number one thing that everybody says is be in a state of gratitude. So, you know, like I said earlier, we are constantly in a state of um, negativity. So even though there's something good happening, we will see what 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 is not happening. So there's a very famous uh, monk uh, who's one of my teachers, Ajahn Brahm. I don't know if anybody's heard of him. So he gave a beautiful example about, you know, when he just started off with his abbot, the first day the abbot told him to make a wall. And obviously Ajahn Brahm doesn't know how to make a wall. So he builds a wall. And then when the abbot comes to look at the wall, Ajahn Brahm is very, very um, embarrassed. And he says, oh, I've, I've messed up in a big way. And he says, why, what have you done? He says, uh, abbot, don't you see the two br bad bricks in the wall? And then the abbot says, but don't you see the 998 perfect bricks in the wall? So this is what I'm trying to say. We all focus on the two bad things or the one negative thing that's happening in our life instead of the one 998 good things that are going on. And we hope that the outside world is going to make me happy. Right. So we let's start with the state of like, let me see what all is going well in my life. So start focusing on all that is going well. And there is always something wonderful happening. Right. Everything. The, and, but 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 our biases. No, let's look at what's not going. I would rather have that job. I would rather have that partner. I would. I wish my government was different. I wish my uh, employer was different. No, you, we have to fit in. We have to mold ourselves and become the person that we want to be. Like I said, it doesn't go down very well with a lot of people because we expect the outside world to make us happy. So there are a lot of things that we can do. You know, I mean, there are exercises. Like I said, there are exercises for the body. Similarly, there are exercises for the brain, which I'm sure this amazing panel is already very aware of. So you start with the, you know, start with the premise of 998 good bricks. That's my one, the first thing I would say. Start focusing on what's going well in your life and then start working on what's not. So it's simple things like, you know, e you know, sleeping, eating. We know all these things, but do we actually put them into practice? We don't. We know it. You know, knowing doesn't mean anything till you actually start doing it. So, you know, yeah, you know, you start exercising. 15 minutes of exercise a day is a massive mood enhancer. But how many people do it? You know, eating the right food instead of the junk, again, changes your mood. Sleeping changes your mood. These are very, very simple things. There's no rocket science to feeling better. So um, I'm not going to hog too much of the time right now, but uh, very happy to share in a, in a written format what you all can do. They are very simple, very basic. If you're really, let's say if you're really feeling down, Ariane, like this might be good for your students. Just tell them to take a walk in nature and look up. The moment you look up, you send a message to your body that I'm feeling good. Because when you see a depressed person, a depressed person is always walking hunched down. You know, their body language is different. So you come out, you change your body language and you start feeling better immediately. Or something as simple as that. You take a pencil or a pen, put it in your mouth. You know, I mean, I know again, uh, COVID times, maybe you don't want to share pencils. You know, doing something like this, changing the way you are, your face structure is immediately sends a different signal to your brain. You know, and the problem is we all run ourselves on the reptilian brain. But we have the reptilian brain, the limbic brain, and the neocortex. So neocortex, which is the new brain, has to be the manager. So if the manager says, do something, you all have, we have to follow. And how to get the manager to do something is take deep, uh, you know, deep breaths. So you get out of that funk that you're in, in a bad mood or in a bad state or in a negative uh, state of mind and change that instant switch. So like I said, I won't take too much of your time. We'll, we'll come back to that. I can go on and on on this subject. Those are some great tips. And uh, I'm sure from audience, uh, people are going to uh, adopt those tips in their uh, own lives. At least I am going to. <laughs> yeah, so, remember the pencil and, and the 998 bricks. <laughs> and I'll start looking at the 998 good bricks. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, so we we uh, now again um, change the subject, change the tone uh, of the discussion that we are having. 
um so here what we want to focus on in is the you know next segment which is enabling access to health now to enable access to health i think um, the critical piece of this entire care continuum of mental health and wellness that we uh, are aware about awareness plays a very important role right um so aryani this question is for you that how would you describe the importance of changing mindsets about mental illness and also destigmatizing it yeah i think the stigma around just discussing mental health in general is what we're trying to tackle at let's talk it because that kind of feeds into the lack of awareness it causes the lack of awareness because people aren't willing to talk about mental health um and and especially in india the stigma is so so prevalent like for example in schools we ask students if you have like a broken leg will you go to the hospital and they're like yes but then why is it that when we're feeling emotionally down when we feel like okay maybe i have a mental illness or you know something bad is happening it's so so hard for us to go to our parents to go to people around us to seek help from a professional um and and that's really because of the stigma around i think on a very basic level being vulnerable because yes there is a stigma around mental illness and depression and anxiety and talking about these things but i think that stems from a very basic thing of if you are vulnerable if you show your emotions then you're weak so sometimes we go to schools and we ask students how many of you feel comfortable crying and like very little of them raise their hand and then they talk about how when you know you're a child and you start crying and immediately your parents say don't cry be strong and just by saying that they're sending the message that somehow if you cry you are not strong and something so pure and something that's supposed to help you feel better and share what you're feeling is is stigmatized from a very young age and this also feeds into so things like toxic masculinity when boys cry and then people tell them that no be a man um this is not how you're supposed to behave so now if if something so simple like crying or expressing negative emotions is stigmatized how will we ever normalize having depression or anxiety and, and then seeking support for it um and and this is a very big problem that you know we it's kind of conditioned into society from a very young age so it, it is hard to break mindsets but it's certainly very possible which is what we're trying to do so i think um on a more positive note if if we just start embracing like being vulnerable in general so these stig- your like if you want to play a part in destigmatizing mental illness and talking about mental health then just start by you know trying to push yourself to share your emotions more to not feel ashamed of things like crying or having negative emotions positive emotions are great to have negative emotions are also great to have it's a part of life um and i think if we just try and push one part away it can cause a lot of harm to us so i think all of us can be healthier and happier if we just stay in touch with the full range of emotions that we experience and and find more acceptance in that that's uh, that's an interesting uh, approach that you share um and like you said right i mean um, showing emotions being vulnerable is perceived as weakness and um, sanju you you have been um, you know at sati buildings uh, an online forum where experts and people who actually have suffered from mental health problems can share their own experiences and help one another out So how has your journey been while finding these people and experts and encouraging those people to share their experiences of suffering when it comes to mental health issues and even um helping the uh forum members understand how did they overcome those issues I I think um Ariana said Ariani um said one really important word which is vulnerable right and the the way that we do it where we encourage people to share their true emotions and true feeling is where we we create a thing called one of those circles and in this circles where we do you know we we allow everyone to share their fears and where we we ask everyone to not judge one another and how we start is that you know we have everyone sit in a circle and then we ask everyone to write down the the most fearful moments on a sheet of paper and then send it back to the moderator in front without having to write their name and then we each read out you know our own paper and then we can tell that whoever wrote this if you want to share more more of the context you're more than welcome to do so maybe the first person might not share the second person might not share but when the third person share then it starts making the fourth person feel more comfortable to share the fifth feel more comfortable and what happened by then is that even the first two people who did not share in the beginning they start to share as well because they sense that now the whole group you know the dynamic have been shifted from being a shame of sharing to wanting to share 
to get validated that my emotions are being validated and that they're valid as well. And so this is very important and, and how we do it in terms of bringing in different people who might be, you know, who might be academically advanced or might not be, you know, for them to feel that being vulnerable is not a weakness. You know, it's sometimes good for us to show that side of us as well. And secondly, we also try to show people that, you know, when, when we do all these um, training and workshops, because a lot of people that we work with are help, help volunteers in community levels. We work in one of the community levels. And so their understanding of mental health might just be just, um, how should I put it, put specifically towards psychology. So where, you know, when you feel something, it's your own fault or that it's, it's, it's your own, you know, negative thoughts that are wrong. So for example, you know, when, when we feel bad, when we feel anything and, you know, um, Constantly people would tell, oh, you're just thinking about it yourself. You know, nobody cares about that. Nobody cares. You're just overthinking it, just overthinking it. But what we're trying to, to showcase to them is that, you know, there are a lot of components to mental health, right? We look at the biological aspect. We look at the psychological aspect. We look at the social and environmental aspect, right? And we look at the interaction between biology and environment. So we show to them that, hey, you know, within your own community, there are a lot of people who use substance abuse, and that might not be their own psychology that's at play. It could be the biology where it's hereditary from their parents down to them for them to be, you know, become addicted easier for them to become addicted to substances and so or is the social environment that they live in that triggers them to use those um, substances as well. So then how can you go and make sure that you understand them, empathetically listening to them so that you then bring them to, you know, not blame them for using systems, but understand them why they're using these substances and then you can help them the best. And the way for them to then use the skill set that we provide is to go in, back into their communities and, again, use vulnerability, vulnerability circle, empathetic listening circles to then bring in these people to show them that we are not telling that this is your fault, but we are here to listen to you and work with you to find the right solution. And so this is how we do it in terms of, you know, trying to show people that, hey, you know, we are not going to give you advice. You know, your own, like when, when, when we are at rock bottom, we know what we need to do to solve our own problem. We don't need anyone else to come and tell us how to solve our problem. The only thing we want other people might do is to encourage us, you know, to motivate us to fix the issues that we are currently having. So for example, during COVID, right, we have so many poor people and they're not, and, and we find it so easy to tell everyone to work from home. And then we've forgotten about those out to have to work in a physical world on a day-to-day -day basis, because we're thinking about it from our perspective of how we would fix our solution for our problem. But for them to fix that problem, you need to listen to them. And this is, this is what we basically do with one of those circles, empathetic listening and bringing in both, you know, people who are from um, different fields to listen to one another and find the right solution that is very balanced. Great. I think uh, that's, that's very important, right? I mean, bringing about that change in culture where you're encouraging people to share, be vulnerable and um, helping them overcome that. I think that that's one of the uh, important pieces of the entire outlook that we have on mental health. Uh, so we are we have invited questions from the uh, audience as well. And uh, till the time that we receive, I think we have uh, just last few minutes left for the session. Uh, so I'll go ahead and ask Shweta that uh, Shweta, you have uh, you you uh, you know you have such a deep understanding about how does one uh, go about in terms of building resilience in terms of their approach of taking care of um, themselves. So uh, could you please share uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I keep going back to, like I said, you take you take ownership. You know, yes. for the moment you take ownership of your feelings, like, but, uh, like Sanju just said, sometimes it's not really easy, you know, because it's your environment, which is very, I mean, I don't like to use the word toxic, but yes, we do have sometimes toxic environments. And then you become a product of that toxicity. But again, the moment, you know, like I said, when you start to taking charge, like you allow your, um, you know, the new brain to become the manager and you understand that, listen, this is my uh, reptilian brain talking, which is allowing other people to run my life. You know, the, that, the, the, the part of that brain is the flight or flight response, right? So you either run away from the problem or you just, you know, cower or you just, you know, give in and you basically flight off. I mean, we rarely fight it. You know, we basically run away from problems. So the idea is to build resilience and knowing that I am in charge of my own feelings, my thoughts gives you that power, 
right? And then there are those certain um, things that you have to do. You have to take charge and you say, okay, today I am going to sit down in silence for five minutes and see what my brain is trying to tell me. And then you see that your brain is trying to distract you because the brain's job is not to keep you happy. The brain's job is to make you survive. You know, uh, you know, when we were young, right, we didn't know how to read. We didn't know how to write. We didn't know how to drive. Today, we probably, I, I think we all know how to read, write, and hopefully all of us know how to drive. But when we were young, we were pretty much happy. You see, and what happens when we grow up, we stop being happy because we stopped practicing it. Because we presumed that happiness is natural and it'll come to us. And your brain is a very smart thing. It starts pruning things that you don't practice. You know, your synapses, every time you have a new, uh, you learn something new, there's a new synapse. But as a child, you had many more synapses for happiness. But as you grow up, those synapses start getting pruned. So you have to actually make an effort, say, look at the bright side, you know, do things that actually make you happy, you build resilience. So I'll tell you another story which happened. So a few days ago, we were driving and uh, there was a little stone that came and hit my windscreen. And of course, my husband started shouting like profanities, oh, bloody hell, blah, 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 blah. And here I'm thinking, oh, my God, we are so amazing. We are so lucky. You know, we got away with a little scratch. The windscreen could have shattered. It could have been a big, big stone. We could have had an accident. So anything could have happened. But look at the way my brain has now changed to look at the bright side. So the same event, somebody sees it as a disaster and somebody sees it as a, as a positive thing. So literally every day, step by step, look at your thoughts. See what you look, look how your thoughts come out. You know, like what are you thinking? Is it always a negative thought or is it a positive thought? So start spending time with your own brain. Literally make your brain your friend. So figure it out. What what is your modus operandi? You know, and then start doing things that help your brain to look at the bright side. Literally, you know, you cannot become an overnight uh, success. You don't change your body overnight. So why do you expect your brain to change overnight? Why do you expect to become happy suddenly? It's a, it's, it's a work in progress. And pr I promise you, the more effort you put in, the more you start looking at the bright side, the more you'll start seeing it. And slowly and steadily, step by step, it happens. Thank you so much, Rita, for sharing that. I Thank think, you. yes, uh, this is a great takeaway for the session that we all need to practice being happy. And I, I agree that we have all uh, forgotten doing that. We take it for granted, yeah. but it's actually a skill and we need to yeah. take ownership of that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, because if you don't practice it, it, it will go away. So, you know, take ownership and then start working towards it. Awesome. Thank you so much all for sharing your views, your perspectives and great insights as to the work that you have been doing. Uh, it has been an amazing discussion and I hope audience had enjoyed uh, the session too. Um, so until then, take care. Bye bye. Uh, see you soon. <laughs>